Preparing to delve in three, two, one. Hello, everybody. Just a quick note before we begin, because we had some extenuating circumstances. The episode that you're about to hear was recorded about a month ago, and I did want to make sure everyone was aware that if you are interested in Heroic Dark, which is what we're talking about with Dustin, uh, there is now also a print-and-play version available on Drive Through RPG. So there is another interesting development that we did not get a chance to talk about when we originally recorded it. I will make sure to leave a link to that in the description of this episode over at Delvecast.com. With that being said, please enjoy this interview where I talk to Dustin DePenning about Heroic Dark. Hello everybody, welcome to Delve. My name is Nathan, and Alex is probably trapped in a car. I don't know why, cars really don't like him very much. I am luckily being joined by a frequent guest of the show, Dustin DePenning. Dustin, thank you for coming back on the show. Hey, thanks for having me back. I really appreciate it. Yeah, um, I was trying to figure out, I think this is like the third time that you've been on. Um, I think it is, it's either the third or the fourth. I was on that live show you did. Yeah, you were on our live panel too. Oh, wow. So yeah, technically with that one, that's, that's actually four. And I have to commend you because you are one of like about four people that are willingly uh, able to brave us for that many go arounds. Yep. So I think it's pretty much you. It's like uh, Dominic Perry, uh, Patrick McNary, and Craig Campbell, I think, are the only ones that have been able to go more than two. Nice. <laughs> so, hey, you're in pretty good company there. Oh, yeah. And uh, we are actually, on this episode, though, we're not really talking about Synthesize, although I do assume that Synthesize is still going strong and going well for you. I would say it's still going. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Fair enough. It is still there. It is still going. Yeah. Still okay. out there. Go buy it if you like tactical battles in sci-fi. Go get it. Yeah. If if tactical battle and sci-fi alone don't get you jazz, put them together. That's what you're going to get with Synthesize. Um, oh, yeah. But no, ac actually, what we're here to talk about is uh, a new thing that you have out called Heroic Dark. Mm -hmm. I know literally nothing about it. One, I guess I'm kind of interested in why it's called Heroic Dark to begin with. Yeah, so it's about, like, these two things where it's a heroic game, it's a heroic setting, it's about cool characters taking risks, doing cool things, and then it's also about this concept of an ever-present darkness that's trying to destroy everything. So the heroes oh. are risking everything to fight and destroy the darkness. And the reason why it's kind of in these vague generic terms is because it's a design your own setting game. The idea is, you know, you make up, you know, the characters, you make up the world. We have like a setting creation rules to like help you walk through the process of making your own setting. Then no matter what you design, there's fundamentally like an evil darkness that's trying to destroy the world you created. So then the game, after you do your session zero and you design your setting and make your characters, the game is about the heroes traveling around the world, trying to fight the forces of darkness and like win the war and try to save the realm. So it's so you kind of lay down a certain thematic element throughout Heroic Dark, but it's non-system uh, non-setting specific, I should say. Yes, non-setting specific. There are some common themes, you know, like mm. the game focuses a lot on. A risk of death and injury it's a big deal like your characters are pretty fragile and uh, it's pretty easy to rack up injuries especially in combat and you know violent confrontation there's a little bit of grimness to the setting because the forces of darkness are always marching onward and trying to make the world a worse place so like there's like those strong themes so it definitely kind of fits in its own little story structure but you can still wrap, you know, you could wrap this into a sci-fi game. You can wrap this into a steampunk game. You can do fantasy or you can do, you know, urban fantasy. It's, you know, open-ended in that way where you get to use the system to fill, fill in the details. Now, why did you want to create this particular system? What was the idea behind it? I felt like, you know, whenever I would do world creation and story creation, you know, for different games... I was attracted to certain patterns that I that would always come up no matter what genre of game it was. 
Mm -hmm. And the things I was attracted to is that, you know, there's high stakes, people can die, whether you like it or not, and you are, and then there is a sense of victory that there's something you're trying to achieve that seems possible, but isn't guaranteed. And you don't know if you're going to win or not. Really like that uncertainty and that high sense of stakes is something I've always enjoyed. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the idea that there is that the whole game world is wrapped around this big conflict that is really, um, you know, driving everything and everybody's decisions. Um, mm. So I just kind of thought about about it, like, you know, what's the simple, you know, this is this pattern. I always, you know, you know, make a mishmash setting in my homebrew games. And then I have like this big conflict that everything revolves around. And then, you know, I try to set these, you know, heroic challenges and stakes and, you know, have a, a chance of, you know, death and, you know, dismemberment and stuff like that. And uh <laughs> So I was like, you know, you know, what's a way I can boil that down and turn it into like a formula that could be used to take that sort of, you know, high stakes emotional themes and, and play style to, you know, and a tons of different settings. So that way you're not, you know, starting from scratch every time you want to tell that type of story. I thought like, you know, what's the most basic way I could think about it? And I was like, well, you know, there's always heroes and then there's always some bad thing. And then I tried to get like, you know, a little more poetic with the bad things. So I was like, oh, the bad thing is going to be the darkness. And mm. then so, so that sort of idea of heroes versus the darkness. And then it kind of made me think about, you know, a lot of different storylines um, like, you know, Lord of the Rings is about heroes versus darkness. You know, the Warhammer yes. universe is about kind of more like antiheroes, but like antiheroes versus the darkness. Mm -hmm. There's just, you know, it's just, you know, a very common, you know. Not not even necessarily good versus evil, you know, but just, you know, yeah. heroes, the, the protagonists, the people who are risking everything, whether they're good or bad, they're still the heroes. Mm -hmm. And then they're opposing the the very bad thing, the thing that right. the thing that threatens everything. So I just felt like it, it was a it was a formula that I had seen a lot of books and movies fall into. Um, you know, it's you know, it's kind of loosely related to the monomyth a little bit, you know, Ooh. Um and, and then uh, it's also, uh, you know, a lot of games, you know, follow this storyline where there's a central conflict that the whole game is involved in. And I just thought, like, you know, why don't I just, you know, try to own up to that cliche and try to make the, like, best open-ended framework that would let you tell whatever story you want following that, you know, that framework. Okay, excellent. Uh, so how do you make that framework? Like, what? How did you start in this process to actually build that framework? So I started backwards. I thought about how I still wanted like sort of a somewhat traditional style of play. Like I know you play like you've played D&D &D and Earthdown and other games, but there's, mm. you know, these other types of games out there like, you know, Apocalypse World or Fate and stuff like that. And, you know, they have all these different yeah. interpretations. And I was like, well, I want a system that's open-ended enough that it can be used for lots of different stories, but I still want it to be traditional enough that you still have these high-stakes adventures where your choices matter, and you can win, and you can lose, and you can die, and you can survive. You know, it just, like, just trying to make a system that um, was generic enough that it could be used for sci-fi or fantasy or whatever, but then, again, you know, fell into those play patterns I really enjoy, those more traditional play patterns, you know. And uh, But I wanted it to be open-ended so you could still tell a lot of different stories with it. So it's kind of, you know, I started with just the core engine, what the players use to go on adventures and play the game. I kind of was loosely inspired by Apocalypse World and loosely inspired by Fate, very, very loosely, where I wanted um, the core actions of the game to be um, like a specific move that you could point to and be like, I do that. I, you, you, you don't say like, oh, I hide. I'm going to roll my hide skill. Or you don't say, oh, I'm going to use my, uh, you know, my spell or whatever. You, you go like, oh, I'm going to try to roll to obscure, which is like oh. a, general con a general concept of hiding information. And that could be hiding right. yourself, hiding an object, hiding an idea, hiding something that you know that you don't want someone else to know. Mm -hmm. Just kind of, you know, more genericize it to where, you know, there's this structure you can follow to help you work out the details of a situation. So I made this list of moves that is sort of intended to be generic, uh, like the way Fate is, where, you know, Fate only has four moves. Um, I think it's attack, defend, 
overcome and gain advantage. Those are the only moves you can do in the game. And then you would dress it up and explain, you know, how one of those four moves applies to the thing you're specifically doing. I wanted more detail than that. So I, I went with seven moves. The, and then I added some uh, some little details to each move that you could use to like work your way through the situation and figure out exactly what happens when you decide to do that thing. All right. So I like the idea of being able to do a little bit of uh, genericizing when it comes to those skills. The, the obscure. I like how that seems just a little bit more vague than than what I'm probably used to, like uh, stealth, you know. Like, I, I don't think of stealth in terms of, like, any kind of social situation. I think of stealth as literally physical stealth, but obscure could really be for either. Right. And that's what I was intending. I, I was like, you know, what's the fundamental story aspect of what's happening? The idea is something is being uh, obscured from someone else. Like, we, you know, one force is trying to hide a piece of information from another force. And, you know, that could be hiding in the shadows, that could be sneaking through the alley, or that could be lying in a conversation. That was the general yeah. idea. So I boiled down this li- list of, of moves, you know, kept them open-ended like that. And then I went from there, from my core mechanics that I was like, felt like we're working. Then I was like, well, you know, the idea is this is open-ended and you're supposed to be able to tell any kind of genre story you want. Uh, So I should probably help people with the process of um, making their own settings. So I kind of tried to think of the loose framework. Like, what's the process I follow when I make a setting? I turned that into a creative exercise uh, that you go through and you have like a setting sheet you fill out. So that way all the players contribute. So the whole table contributes to make the game setting, actually. So it's not just the GM. How does that work? I'm intrigued by this. So uh, the whole table actually works on building the setting. How does the system encourage that? The way you officially do it is you get the setting sheet out and you flip it to the back where it lists some uh, little genre elements, some little story elements, okay. like technology, like, oh, is technology a big part of this? Or you might have another story element like magic or a story element like monsters. And what you do is you go around the table one at a time. Players can uh, check a element and be like this element is part of our game world so technology is part of our game world and then monsters is part of our game world sure or they can x it out entirely and say this is not part of our game world you're not allowed to undo the contributions of the other person so you have to build on top of what they did you go around the table one at a time choosing what elements are in and out and then you go around the table taking turns uh, elaborating on what those elements mean you start posing ideas like, oh, technology is there and monsters are there. I'm going to pose the idea that the technology created the monsters and the monsters run on super high-tech technology. So they're related to each other. So you you mess with that. And then you go around, you know, like, oh, well, magic is part of it too. And I'm going to say that uh, magic and technology are incompatible and you can't have both at the same time. You know, you just kind of, people just... People just pose ideas like that and keep building on it. And right. then uh, it builds up to a crescendo where someone gets an idea. The question you're trying to answer as you build the setting is, what's the darkness? What is the thing that's threatening everything? Yes, I like this. Regardless of how we say that it's like it's a, it's a storytelling adventure that everybody goes on together, there's also that whole thing, but the GM makes whatever decision that they want. <laughs> and in this it feels like uh, that's kind of off the table. Everybody has to be involved with the process of actually building the story and the setting. Right. When you get to an actual game, when you leave session zero and get to an actual game session, there mm-hmm. is still there is still that somewhat traditional aspect of, you know, the GM is in control to a degree and what the GM says goes. But, you know, the yeah. GM does have limitations placed mm-hmm. upon them. The GM does have guidelines of what they're supposed to do in order to facilitate the best situation and then the gm is supposed to be basically a neutral challenger who puts the players in situations of uncertain outcome where you don't know if the players will live or die is basically what the gm's job is well i was figuring that that must be the case when i saw the setting sheet because they're beholden to what the setting sheet says and the the preliminary that was done with the players right right they are beholden to that yeah, and, you know, uh, the game encourages them to build on it and evolve it, um, you know, and flesh it out because you're just starting with a skeleton of an idea of a game world in Session Zero. 
but mm-hmm. they're not allowed they're not allowed to undo any of the fundamental decisions that the players made while building the game world. I see. Okay. Uh what I'm looking I'm looking at the setting sheet right now. And uh so I wanted to ask you about a, a couple of the mechanics that are on this. Uh one of the ones that really stands out to me is that you have like three society pieces that are yeah. listed. So you have the oppressed society, the afraid society, and the denial society. Which again, I like how you've kind of, you know, decentralized those terminologies because they, they are I understand kind of what you're talking about, but they're vague enough that I, I don't have a pigeonholed idea of it. But what are societies? So the idea is, you know, another trope I fell into with all of my homebrew games and then also with Synthesize, and then I've seen it in a lot of stories as well, is mm. you always want powers at play that have conflicting needs and are dealing with each other in different ways. And, you know, I thought, you know, oh, you know, three, three different, you know, power groups, three different groups of people or societies yeah. uh, okay, is, yeah. is enough to get an interesting dynamic. So I'll just require mm-hmm. that during setting creation, you think of three, soci- three different societies that, the, uh, that are powerful in the world. And then I thought, you know, well, since this game is ultimately about, you know, the darkness and fighting the darkness, what I'm going to do is I'm going to differentiate these three societies based on what their relationship to the darkness is. Mm. So uh, the oppressed society is a uh, society overrun by the darkness. They are on the front lines dealing with whatever the big problem is. Mm hmm. And, you know, you make up whatever you want, but at the end of the day, they they are a group of people who are just, you know, dealing with the worst of the worst as far as the darkness goes. Right. And and then the Afraid Society is, Mm. like, the group of people who aren't affected by the darkness yet, necessarily, or they're only slightly affected by the darkness, and they're aware of it, and they're afraid of it. That's why they're called the Afraid Society. Um, Mm Mm-hmm. But, you know, they still have some fight left in them. They still have some distance between them and the darkness. Mm. And then the third society, the Denial Society, I thought it'd be interesting and add some, you know, natural conflict to the game if one of the societies pretended the darkness didn't exist. And they're the society that's so far removed from the darkness that they won't even acknowledge it as a problem that needs to be addressed. Right. Well, that would never happen, right? <laughs> oh, yeah, never. <laughs> no, not, that never happens like in real life either. No, those are good. I, triangle makes perfect sense when it comes to, like, a power struggle uh, because it gives you three aspects are usually really great to kind of differentiate and define those. And, uh, and it also makes conflicts with any of those very interesting. And any two of them aligned against you uh, will completely change. There is no real good way to have a balance of power when you have three different societies that are involved. Staying on the setting sheet for a minute. Okay, so places, institutions, uh, are those all based on the societies themselves? Yeah, I kind of, I had this idea as I started working on the mechanics for the, like the, the bigger narrative, which is this over, overarching fight against the darkness. Um, I wanted a way to measure um, the success of the darkness versus uh, the player's success of saving the realm. And I thought mm. like an easy way to do that would be like, well, let's break the realm up into distinct pieces and then give each piece of the realm a health score, almost like a game of pandemic or something to where you can see how close to defeat each part of the realm is. And mm-hmm. then... Um, so I thought, you know, oh, like, well, I have these three societies. What if there's three places associated with each society just to kind of give you some uh, variance? And, you know, I thought nine fronts to fight the darkness at, you know, was an interesting, you know, number mm-hmm. to to deal with. I didn't want to have, you know, a whole ton of fronts. So that way you felt like, oh, I, we only go to each place once. Or I didn't want like too right. few fronts where you're like, oh, we're going to that place again. Jesus. You know? <laughs> yeah. 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 No, that's that's good. So you have three different kinds of societies that you're building, and then each of those have essentially three. Because rule of three is always aesthetically pleasing anyway, but it also does make for very interesting conflicts and, uh, right. and interesting layouts. And I'm guessing that the idea of how far down the the dark track and heroic track are are implemented with these little counters that I see that are actually very intimidating for me. 
uh, which is the the dark ending track and the heroic ending track. How, how do I fill these or avoid filling in these very scary boxes? The game when you you know when you're doing the setting creation or or when you're deciding you know what your character does. You know, the game has sort of that more modern, more open-ended bent, um, that kind of more story-oriented bent. Uh, when you're looking at just playing through a session, the structure of a session, it has that more traditional point of view where you are on a mission and that mission has success conditions and that mission has failure conditions and the GM is in control of what that is. Mm. And basically, the GM has a, a session sheet where they assign point values to different objectives. And then when the players achieve an objective, that's positive points. When the players fail an objective, that's negative points. And then at the end of the session, you add up all the positive and negative points and you affect the health score of the location they're in. So if they you know, did really well, the health score of the location goes up. If they did really poorly, the health score of the location goes down. Whenever mm. a health score of a location goes up, then the uh, heroic ending track fills. So you're like, oh, okay, you know, we did something good. We made a difference. We are closer to, you know, winning. So the heroic track fills up. The Mm -hmm. heroic track also fills up uh, if you max out the health score of an institution. So if you raise it and you max it out, that's two points. So you're like, sweet, I earned two points for this really good session. You also earn extra points for every single location that's at max, which it's Mm -hmm. it's pretty difficult to get locations at max because the game master can use the forces of darkness to like invade the areas you didn't go to and then weaken them slightly. Mm. So, so you're kind of like this game of whack-a-mole trying to keep the scores up. <laughs> it is like pandemic. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so when I get uh heroic, like ending points, like I've, I've done good, I did a good job, but then it gets undone. Do I start losing those? No, you never lose. I didn't want the game to take forever. So right, that's what I was wondering. Yeah, so yeah. what it what it is is it's a race between the heroic points and the dark points. Mm-hmm. So uh as you're playing the game, every time something bad happens, instead of losing a heroic ending point, you gain a dark ending point instead. Gotcha. And then whichever track fills up first, if the heroic track fills up first, then boom, the game ends. It's the end of the campaign. This is like telling you you've done enough story, you've played this game long enough time to mm-hmm. wrap it up you know like yeah. that like that 26 sessions you were telling me about in that other game you were playing. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah 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 and it's like time to wrap it up so then you have earned you have earned the good ending so what you do is um there's like a little little end of game um epilogue rules that the players all go around telling little stories about their characters based on the end of the game uh so you just like you know you wrap everything up like oh the heroes won and here's what what happened to the realm But then, of course, the reverse can happen where if the dark track fills up first, then the ending is bad and then the darkness wins and the realm is forever lost. Uh, I just thought it was interesting that you could play this huge overarching campaign and not know if you were going to get a good ending or a bad ending. And then the GM doesn't know either. In the dark ending track, do the players have to go around and tell the sad story of what happened to their characters afterwards? Yes. Cool. I'm on board for this. I want I want gloom the RPG. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. exactly what, You know what you should you, you know what you should think about is the hard mode is that the dark ending track is way shorter than the heroic ending track. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like 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 if you want to do this on super hard mode, you start with like oh, yeah. five of these already marked up. <laughs> And it's like, sorry, your party has been, like, uh, just, like, prowling around at a pub somewhere for the majority of the first month. Sorry. Yeah. You're already on a bad place. Hey, there you go, folks. Some optional rules you could set up at the beginning. You might not be already certain point in. (laughs) Here's, There's something fun for you. Here's where I point out that the game is fully written and been extensively playtested, but the game is still in early edition because the balance of how the long form takes like the balance of how quickly the dark track fills and how quickly the heroic track fills right you know those things i need i need a lot more data to make sure i got that right 
Because you know, yes. I feel like I feel like I got that right with my games I ran. I feel like I got that right, but you know, it may not mm-hmm. work for every. It may not work for everybody. And yeah. you know, I, uh, you know, you might discover, hey, when we play the game the way we understand it based on the rules you wrote, like, mm. oh, the dark ending track fills up way too fast, <laughs> you know, yeah, or yeah. or something like that. So one of the things that you know seemed to seem to be true in my play tests but mm-hmm. I still want to see how it works for everybody else is I designed this system around how difficult the monsters are allowed to be for the, for the GM, like how difficult the enemies are allowed to be. No matter what, every session, the game gets harder. Every session, the level of power of enemies, the GM can throw at you goes up. What I was intending, and this is what I would really, I really hope this is true. And I found it to be true in my play tests, but again, you never know how people are going to interpret your rules or, or what choices they're going to make when they play that make it different than what you experience. The thing that I went for is the idea that the game starts out kind of easy. Your first session, you win. You Every objective you pass, you defeat every enemy, everything's fine. But then at the rate at which the enemies get stronger, you know, sort of late in the campaign, you might reach an area where the enemies are just so strong that you can't win and then you have to sacrifice at least one objective maybe you have to sacrifice two objectives and then those negative points add up and then you don't you don't earn any heroic points for the session and then you know the way the you know mechanics for how the dark points get earned works is like the dark can earn anywhere from like one to six points in a single session if something really bad happens what i was going for and that's what i would love to hear everyone else's experiences when they play the early edition what I was going for is that you get that early lead, but then the game just really starts laying into you. And then you have to, you have to fight tooth and nail as the darkness starts making rapid progress. And it really, you know, and then like a single missed session, it's like a single session where the players failed almost every objective, like can really negatively impact the story. Yeah. So you, you have to pretty much be on the ball continuously because missteps are deadly. Yes. That kind of reminds me of uh, when I played XCOM, because in that particular game, it's like a strategy game, and you're always building new technologies or trying to allocate resources. But if you start falling behind the ball, the the alien threat does not. They their their tech level continues to go up at the same rate it was going to, regardless of how well you're doing. And if you screwed up, that's just too bad. <laughs> sorry <laughs> yeah totally i i had that exact i actually was playing a lot of xcom when i was designing this game <laughs> oh <laughs> so, hey there you there you go okay yeah, I, I, it. uh it, it all makes sense now yeah because you know that thing in xcom where it's like okay i have like my veteran troops i have like my colonel and then your colonel dies in a session and you're like might as well just reload because i can't, I can't, I can't take my green troops in at this point in the game <laughs> That okay. exact that exact thing happens in Heroic Dark. Yeah. By by default, there is no way to resurrect a character. Mm-hmm. So when a character dies, they're dead forever. All new characters start at level one. Yep. Perfect. It's like XCOM in hardcore mode. Yes. Perfect. But I mean, um the replacement characters unlock special abilities and level up much faster than okay. uh than the previous characters so you have the opportunity to catch up to where you were so it's not right. quite as it's not quite as brutal as XCOM where you're like sure. well I'm starting from ground zero and there's nothing I can do about it. right um but or square one I mean but yeah. um the uh uh so you know you start at level one but you you level up a lot faster so you can get to where you used to be much more quickly and then also uh replacement characters have special abilities that original characters don't have and okay. um so there's a thing called a mantle and this is something that i came up with talking with ron edwards so ron edwards is a designer who made sorcerer and a bunch of other and troll babe and a bunch of other like really crazy rpgs that people thought were really interesting and really challenging oh. to the rpg rpg medium he's an extremely opinionated guy who really <laughs> loves very specific types of games and he really likes to rip on old D games even though he still plays D. Yeah. You know, because like he he's admitted that he ran like a whole campaign in fourth edition, which is like so some people consider the worst edition of D&D, you know? Yeah, I know some um, of those people. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so like he, he still plays and enjoys D&D, but as a designer, he's always ragging on it. why aren't people going far farther 
why aren't people doing more interesting things? Why aren't, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. And um, so I like chatting with him just to challenge my perspectives and challenge the way I look at my game. And yeah. he was the one who brought up the point that, well, you know, it's interesting that you that the character dies and it's interesting that they get replaced by a green character who's in this high stake situation. But you know, there's, you know, he's always on about story. He's really into this mm-hmm. idea of, he's really into this idea of narrative is what he looks yeah. for in, in, in a lot of games. And so he kind of sure. challenged me in that area and was like, you can make that element of replacing a dead character more interesting, more important. And I thought about it. And so, you know, talking with him came up with this idea of mantles, which is you choose like a heroic virtue that the previous character was either really good at or really bad, at, either one. Mm -hmm. And the character who replaces the dead character, there's two requirements. Um, That character that replaces them has to be connected to the character they're replacing in some way. So that way it makes sense that they're like taking on the responsibilities of the character that died. And then the other requirement is that the replacement character takes on the mantle that best matches the dead character. So it's like you're filling in big shoes and you're like, well, the last character was this amazing warrior. So I'm going to take on the mantle of vengeance, which is Mm. like that I strike out against the darkness and really fight them. And then that gives you Mm. some special, that gives you some special abilities that only a character with the mantle of vengeance would have. Or you could be like, you know, my character was really ignorant and had a fatal flaw where he never took stuff seriously. And then at the end of the day, like not thinking things through is what killed him. You could have the replacement character take on the mantle of knowledge which is like information is your best friend and knowing the enemy is the best thing you can do. So then you get these special abilities that only a character with the mantle of knowledge has. That's interesting. I do like the idea that you have almost a story. Um, you have like story elements for the new character that has to replace the old one. And that also has some mechanical ability that's, that's attached to it. So the story and the mechanics are like intertwined in that kind of scenario. Right. So character creation, I'm interested in, like, I know what happens when I take on the mantle of a previous character, but what is the actual character creation itself? So what do I have to think about? There's basically three things that you have to decide, like, what you want them to be, what you want to level them up. You you have your attribute scores, like what scores you want your attributes to be. It's a traditional game in the sense that you have attributes that describe what you're good at and what you're bad at. Uh, The next thing you have to decide what you want to pick and choose for your character is your skills. Skills are like things you're always good at no matter what. Attributes are like things that you can roll for and you have a better chance of rolling well. And skills are things that you're always good at no matter what. So a good attribute would let you be able to improvise well because you could do lots of things your character couldn't normally do and then have a good chance of rolling well. But then, you know, you're not guaranteed successes because it's a dice pool game. And the attributes give you re-rolls, let you re-roll the dice. So if you roll the dice and you don't get enough successes, you can use your attribute to re-roll some of the dice and hopefully get more successes. Skills are flat success bonuses. So if you have a skill in something, you're guaranteed one success in addition to whatever you roll. So you always beat a difficulty one, and then you might roll better and get above that. And then I, I added one more layer on top of a skill, which gives you one success. You have a specialization which gives you an additional success. So you can have two six, two guaranteed successes, which means you're always good at something difficulty d- two, which is like medium difficulty. So you have your attributes and your skills. And then after that, you have something called power moves. And these are like the weird, unusual things your characters can do that other characters cannot normally do. Power moves are kind of like stunts from fate, except a little more crunchy and a little more detailed. But the idea is you, for starter characters, you get to choose from a list of pre-made powers that have fill in the blanks. And then you fill in the blanks to customize it and make it make sense for your character. And each of those power moves is tied to one of the core actions of the game. So you can take a power move for obscure. You're like, oh, like I'm really good at obscuring this certain type of thing in this certain type of situation. And then you fill in the blanks. You can take a power move for motivate which is the general move you use for influencing npcs and you're like my character is really good at motivating npcs to do a specific thing in a specific situation and then you fill in the blanks you can also take power moves to let you do something you wouldn't normally be able to do 
that's what makes it seem a little similar to fate stunts because you know fate stunts are primarily about oh i can use this skill to do this move and you normally can't use this skill to do that move uh th- this is sort of, this is sort of there too where you're like oh i have a magic character and i want to be able to attack people with magic so you take a magic attack power move which is like i can use my attack skill my magic skill in order to attack people so you have that option too so your pa- the power moves either describe something you're really good at better than a normal person or something that is really weird that only you can do like the person who can attack with magic you know they're not going to start off with you know with a level one power they're not going to start off like way better than someone with a gun but at the end of the day they have this additional way of attacking that a a normal person can't do you know a normal person can really only hurt someone if they have a gun or if they have a knife but you can hurt people even if you just look at them and point your magic wand at them that's basically what it is so when you build your character you work on their background, you answer some questions about, you know, who they are, where they come from, how they fight the darkness, what their personality is like. You kind of answer all those questions. But then you choose, is my character going to have really good attributes or is my character going to have really good skills or is my character going to have a lot of power moves? So you choose one of those three options and they're called archetypes. You have the natural, which is the archetype that has a lot of attribute points. You have the prodigy, which is the character that has a lot of skill points. And then you have the wild card, which is the character that has a lot of power move. And then, so then from there, you then fill out your character sheet and build your character based on which archetype you chose. I do like the idea that different, different kinds of heroes are just going to be heavy into one of these things. It kind of reminds me a little bit of, because I have to use video games as a reference, but it reminds me a little bit of like KOTOR. When you choose like soldier scoundrel or um, uh, scout at the very beginning, um, scouts are going to get feats, uh, and soldiers are going to get more attribute points, and uh, what is it? Scoundrel is going to get more uh, skills. So, so you have a lot of options for that. Right. That was the exact logic I was applying for character creation. Because I was thinking, I was thinking, you know, beyond the powers you choose beyond the attributes you choose beyond the story you make up. I still wanted characters to feel, you know, one, one more degree different from each other. So I added that. Ooh, yes. I have scrolled down even further. I am looking at careers. So, uh, when I build a character, I have to come up with a career. Mm -hmm. Uh, and so crafter, expert, communicator. Oh, I see what you did here. This is more like these, these are still kind of vague. Because I can figure out exactly what I want to do for a crafter. I could be a lot of different kinds of crafters. Ooh, cybernetic fabricator, though. That is a good example. I, I want to fabricate as many cybernetics as I possibly can. <laughs> there's, so there's six different kind of basic ideas for careers. What was the development process for that? Did, did you have to whittle this down from a longer list? Or did you just yeah. try to consolidate? Yeah. Yeah, I, I uh, whittled down from a longer list because I was trying to think of, you know, I wanted, I didn't want to, I didn't want to leave the players with no help. I didn't want, I didn't want to be like, hey, your character has a job. What is it? And right. then you're like, I don't know. I don't know what it is. <laughs> I wanted to guide is. people's imagination and, and give them a starting point of what their character's job is. So I tried to come up with, you know, list a bunch of different jobs in a bunch of different settings. Like, oh, you have the blacksmith. Oh, you have the sci-fi cybernetics guy. Oh, those guys both make things. Maybe that's an archetype, a crafter. And then I kind of worked that way where I thought of, you know, different jobs in different settings. And then I tried to come up with an archetype that would represent that. So I came up with those six archetypes just to spur your imagination of, oh, you know, what would a crafter be in this setting? That That's what my character is. And um, the career is a really interesting aspect of your character because the way the you know it talks about this in the introduction the the one flaw of my game is the introduction gets a little too game theory a little bit (laughs) one of the things i talk about in the game is a big part of heroic dark is believability you have these more story oriented games and you have these more traditional simulationist oriented games they don't always follow what's believable they kind of you know follow their own elements of what they want to do And I thought, you know, it's important that if a character does something, it's believable that that character can do it. You know, I don't want people to just, you know, decide suddenly, oh, my character knows how to hack computers or, oh, my character knows how to fly this spaceship. I wanted it, you know, it needs to make sense. 
I thought, you know, one of the primary ways to justify what your character would know how to do is their career, like what they've what they've done with their life. That's going to kind of give you a a good point of reference for you know what things they've been exposed to and what things they've experienced. And they may not necess- they may not be good at those things. They may not be bad at those things, but they've been exposed to those things, so they know about those things. That actually plays into the way the GM works because uh, when the GM is setting a difficulty for an action, like a character goes, "I want to play. I want to fly the spaceship." One of the things that the GM is supposed to look at is how believable is it that the character knows how to do this. And then, if the character d- wouldn't know how to do it, the GM is supposed to up the difficulty higher. Yeah, no, I've I've spent my whole life, uh, you know, just like working on the docks. Oh, so uh, you want to fly a spaceship? Yes, that's going to be difficult. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. it's going to be a difficult thing to do. I do like the fact that you went down to six because it gives me enough options that I don't feel like I'm I'm really herded into anything particularly. But I don't feel like I have choice paralysis either, uh, which I right. I I have seen lists that people have done where I'm like I don't even know where to start. <laughs> I am so confused. So so this this is good. I almost th- feel like between crafter, expert, communicator, laborer, vanguard, and performer, I can basically just imagine a job that's in whatever setting we're doing, like once you establish that, and whatever that is, right. it will probably fall into one of these categories anyway. I just have to figure out what makes the most sense. And that's what I was trying to do. Is I was trying to do meaningful distinction, like trying to boil everything down to its meaningful distinction. You know, fate did that with their moves. They're like, you know what? We think we can boil everything a character does down to one of four things. I felt like that was a little too reductive. It felt like a little too much the same to me, you know, where I only had four choices. So I always tended to go higher than that. You know, that's why I have seven core moves that you can do instead of only four core moves. And then you have six jobs you can choose from instead of only four jobs to choose from. But again, you know, I agree with you. I didn't want it to be overwhelming. I didn't want there there to be so many things you're doing that you don't know where to start. And uh, another thing about this game that, you know, is interesting to project management nerds, uh, probably doesn't make sense to game nerds, but makes sense to project management nerds, is I was learning a lot about Scrum while I was designing this game. Okay. And Scrum is a framework methodology for building projects. Like, okay. oh, the, this is the general pattern you want to follow to successfully build a project, you know, from the ground up. And it's designed to be a really open-ended, loose, flexible system that has just enough definition to get you moving in the right direction. I was thinking, oh, I wanted to do the same thing for a game. My idea is you use my game to make other games, basically. You, you use my yeah. game to make your, make your own game about fighting the darkness. I wanted to provide just enough structure that you would move in the right direction and then do the right thing, but not provide so many choices and so many details that you get bogged down with the process and you get bogged down with, you know, all the choices you have to make and all the stuff going on. Like it would needed to be somewhat lightweight. So that way, yeah, it got you moving in the right direction and gave you the tools you needed to do what you want to do, but it didn't weigh you down. See, when I hear Scrum, I either think of a rejected Pokemon, or I figure that must be an acronym. It's one of those, right? No, it's neither. Oh. (laughs) I I don't entirely remember where the word comes from, but it has something to do with the word Grimmage. It has to do with the type of athletic maneuver. Oh, okay. Well, it's it's an athletic thing. I'm not going to know what it is. So, like, is there any, like, combat mechanics? Do I roll initiative or anything like that? Like, when I actually get into the game, what are the... the core mechanics of actually playing so the core mechanics of actually playing is that the uh, players go around trying to figure out what to do they listen to the gm listen to what, what the gm's feeding them and then they kind of improvise on top of that and and try to push the story in the direction that makes sense to them and then they ch- they choose like you know they decide like oh there's something weird is happening out in the desert you know so the objective for the gm might be find out what's happening in the desert and then the players decide how they're going to achieve that so they're like, oh, I'm going to go talk to a highway patrolman who goes out in the desert at night, you know, front patrol and see what information he can give me. So then, you know, when they get when they get there, then they start using those core moves to kind of role play out the scene. They use uh, the motivate move to get the highway patrolman to tell them what they want to tell them. They use the reveal move 
to actually like comprehend what he's saying and to figure out if he's telling the truth or if he's hiding something. They use the obscure move when it's like, hey, but you guys aren't going to go out in that desert. Are you right? Because it's illegal. We've locked everything up. And then they have to use the obscure move like, no, we're not going out in the desert, even though they totally are. You just kind of work your way through things that way. But then, you know, it is encouraged because, you know, threat you know physical threats death and bodily harm is a big part of the game it is encouraged that things turn violent at some point during the session and then a fight happens and then the rules for fighting are a little different than the rules for just general role play for fighting there is like an initiative order basically everybody gets one action on their turn it's assumed that they can you know move a certain amount of space whenever they take that action you know so you can take any action against anyone within a certain distance of you I wanted an initiative order that was surprising where you didn't know what was going to happen next, but the players still had an ability to kind of influence things and try to have a chance at going first, even though it's pretty random and you don't know what's going to happen. The idea is you take uh, a bunch of playing cards and get a bunch of pairs, like a pair of aces, a pair of twos, a pair of fours, and then you give one of each pair to every, every person in the fight, including the NPC. So each NPC gets assigned a card, like the four of spades or the five of spades or what have you. And then the players get assigned cards as well. And then you take the second half of the pair and shuffle it into the deck. And that's the acting order. You shuffle the whole deck and then you reveal from the top down. And whoever's card gets revealed, that's the character that gets to act. So it's totally, ran- it's totally random and surprising and you never know who's going to go when until their card comes up and then you're like oh it's your turn in order to introduce that element of still being able to influence it still trying to have a chance of going first characters can pull a move called react which gives them a chance to interrupt somebody else's turn they spend a a limited resource called an energy point that like kind of tracks how strong your character is you spend an energy point and then you roll your dice and you try to get more successes than the person's turn you're stealing And if you succeed, you swap cards with them. So if an ace came up and I wanted to go first before the ace went, um, I would roll my dice. And if I succeeded, I would trade assignment with them. So now I'm an ace. So I match the card that's up. So now I go. So say I was a four. I give that player my four and they don't get to go now until the four is revealed. So there's still that chance that that element of risk where you can spend a resource and have a chance to go before your turn was supposed to happen. But it's it's not guaranteed to kind of keep that tension up. I, I like that. You know, I, I it's very interesting the idea that my my turn order is a little bit more randomized. I don't know when I'm going. Uh, I, I just don't see that very often. But it does kind of make more sense if you think about it in terms of like how a combat system. Well, in a combat system, I guess everybody goes at the same time. If, you, if you're yeah. in an actual combat situation. <laughs> It doesn't really work very well for pen and paper, though. <laughs> no. It's a little bit tricky for everyone to act at the same time. With your playtesting, how many sessions on average does it take to get to either a win or a lose condition? What I've done with my testing at the middle of the road is 15 sessions. So it's not, okay. super, long, not super long, but definitely long enough to feel like a full story arc. Sure. And uh, what are you using for your base die? It's a d6 dice pool and you only okay. succeed on a six so you're trying to roll sixes oh you only succeed on a six okay do you have any kind of modifiers or anything that will help with that or? yeah your attributes let you re-roll dice so okay. you get extra rolls uh everyone rolls the same amount of dice five d6 so everyone has a chance of getting a one to five successes um mm-hmm. but five is like statistically impossible yahtzee <laughs> yeah people with attributes get to re-roll the failed dice so you so people with attributes can never get more than five successes on their roll, but they have a better chance of getting more successes. So they get to re-roll their dice. And then your skills add guaranteed successes on top of whatever you rolled. So okay. if I have a skill and a specialization in the thing I'm doing, that's two successes that I'm guaranteed. Mm-hmm. And then I roll the dice and I do my re-rolls and then I end up with three more successes. That's five successes, which would be mm-hmm. enough to accomplish a really difficult task. And then, you know, like most modern games, there's a meta currency that you can use, you know, that you can spend uh, to get additional successes. Like, oh, I really can't mm-hmm. fail in this. So I'm going to pop my heroic point and get even more successes. So mm-hmm. the maximum number of successes you can theoretically get is uh, 10 is the okay. maximum number of successes you can get. But that means but that's like statistically impossible because you have to roll maximum on the dice 
have a skill and a specialization and then use a heroic point to get three successes. So, okay, that makes sense. Like, on the one hand, it is kind of tricky to land on a six, on a six-sided die. But on the other hand, if I'm good at something, uh, hopefully I'll be able to do it easier. Are they heroic points? Because Is that why it's called heroic dark? Or because it's called heroic dark, you made them heroic points? It's because it's called heroic dark that I made, made them them. heroic points. <laughs> I figured that it was a chicken and the egg scenario, but I can never tell. Which one it was. At the end of the day, I had a real specific mission where I wanted a a light framework where you could just tell lots of different stories about this idea of heroes fighting darkness and risking their lives and possibly dying and not knowing if they're going to win. You know, that I I wanted, that's what I wanted. So I just built, you know, the cleanest, most open ended system I, I could comprehend based on all the different types of games I've played. I'd say maybe the one thing that we haven't touched on that's in there is as your character levels up, you uh, get XP points, and then you can use those XP points on new moves. Your starting moves, your starter power moves that you can get, you know, you choose from a list. Like, oh, I want this one, or oh, I want that one. But then uh, as you level up, there's a whole chapter about designing your own moves. It's kind of like streamlined, simplified burps almost, (laughs) where you're like, oh, I choose this, and it has this amount of damage, and then it has this range, so this is how much it costs. And you just yeah. kind of, you know, customize things that way. So it's even though it's an open ended kind of more streamlined game, it still has a little bit of that crunchy character customization that you get from more traditional games like D&D. Do I technically have levels or is it mostly the decentralized idea of uh, putting putting points Yeah, it's, you know, I I always say you start at level one, but in reality, it's just the starting point. After that, it's you just get XP points and then you assign those XP points to skills and powers and attributes. That's what I was wondering. Okay, yeah, I'm seeing more and more uh, systems, uh, maybe just because of my exposure to more systems that are kind of eschewing the very idea of a physical level number in favor of something more like what you're talking about. Which I I do appreciate, uh, just because it feels like you know as I as I go along I'm specifying things that I actually want. Uh, it's not like I ding and all of a sudden I get a bunch of things, you know. Uh, yeah. So I I do like that idea. Like I came into this not knowing anything about heroic dark, uh, just that I was probably going to be heroic and there's probably going to be something dark. Uh, but but I do like this idea that you've kind of taken um, a distilled version of like the light versus dark battle that we've seen before to create a system that allows you to do it really with any of those settings. Yeah, that's exactly what I was trying to do mm. right on the nose. Then I actually understood something. It's rare on this show, but I did it today. <laughs> <laughs> I want to thank you for coming on the show and talking to us again, braving the waters for either your third or fourth time, depending on if we count live episodes. Yeah. Uh, And if uh, anyone was interested in more information about Heroic Dark or the work that you do, uh, where would be the best places for them to find you? If you just want to see the game, because the early edition of the game is completely free. So it's 134 pages and you can download it and play the whole game. I would recommend yeah. going to Drive Through RPG and searching for Heroic Dark, and then yeah. uh, downloading that, and then uh, following me on Drive Through RPG because that's the mail list I typically hit up the most. I do have a Facebook page for Synthesize, and I do have a Twitter, um, but I don't post on those very often. So mm-hmm. to get updates, you can follow me on Twitter at at Depending Dustin. And then, you know, the Synthesite RPG has its own Facebook page, which I'll give you the link for that as well. Every time I do a release, I, I email every person who's followed me on Drive-Thru RPG. So yeah. when you when you go download Heroic Dark, just make sure to follow me on Drive-Thru RPG. And if uh, you want to find out anything more about Delve or all the other things that we're working on, uh, boy, it feels like there's a lot. At least it feels like I'm working on a lot of things. Uh, you can find it all on DelveCast.com, and uh, why not click on our Patreon banner? We have the full, unedited episodes, uh, so that if you want to hear me uh, stumble a lot and stammer, good news, we've got a thing for you. Uh, you can find it there uh, and become a patron. Thank you to our Shiny Level patrons, by the way, Bonnie Ainsworth and Dominic Perry. And uh, I want to also say 
that we are on so many podcast apps. We are on Spotify and on Twitter. Yeah, we're on, yeah, the podcast app Twitter. Good, Nathan. See, you get that in the outtakes, <laughs> folks. We are on so many podcast apps. We're actually on Spotify. We're on iTunes. We're on Google Play. We're on iHeartRadio. We're all over the place. You can find us everywhere. Listen to in your car or in your scooter. If you have a scooter, I don't know, your life. Uh, please rate and review and subscribe. Uh, we always appreciate that. And you can also find us on Twitter. I am at Citanium. Alex is at EXP Limited. And the show is at Delve Podcast. And with that, I would just again want to thank Dustin for, uh, one, giving a holler out and saying, hey, you want to talk about this on the show? And then being so very gracious when Alex's, Al Alex's car, I think, ate him those two times now, <laughs> um, and, and being very accommodating. So thanks, thanks for all of that, Dustin. Oh, it's no problem. I think the duo format worked great. Do we even need Alex? You know what? He, w when we do the live episode, I'll ask him if we need Alex. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. I'll, ask, I'll ask Alex if we need Alex, and he'll probably say no. <laughs> <laughs> do I get to sleep through the interviews? Yes, Alex, if you, do, you get to sleep or you get to be locked in your car, which one do you want? I, I, I love you, Alex. You know I do. Thank you for listening to Delve. From both Alex trapped in a car or a bed or a bed in a car... And also for me, the one you're listening to right now, Nathan, uh, thank you for joining us, and we will see you on the next episode. Bye, everybody. We were going down a river in Caracas, and uh, Andy said, you've got all these mosquitoes around you. Uh, anybody want to try different things to, you know, stop, stop that from being a, an issue? And so we have people that do herbalism and that kind of thing, and they're just uh, like, yeah, we're, we're going to find plants that are out in the jungle, and we're going to use that, rub it on our skin. Uh, you know, they, there was a whole bunch of different thoughts about how we could go about that, and I was like, okay, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to invent a bug zapper, and <laughs> I'm going to put it on the front of the boat, <laughs> because... According to my character sheet, one of the abilities that I know is stun for things I can put into into gear. So I'm going to mm -hmm. use a bunch of the parts that I that I got and I'm going to imbue it with the stun quality in order to try and cast some sort of a net. And then I called it what did I eventually call it? It was the uh Goldbloom's Revenge. <laughs>